The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a science fiction legend, a star cluster in chaos, children grown to order, and the Red Queen returns. And this time it's not off with your head. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio, still filling in for Tony Daniel, who, last I checked, had been recruited by the Royal Manticore and Navy to help fend off Mason incursions in their sovereign space. We've got a very special episode here for you today. Here in a minute, I'll be joined by the legendary Lois McMaster Bejold to celebrate the re-release of her Hugo Award-winning classic, The Vor Game, as well as to talk briefly about some of the implications of her latest Vor Kosigan novel, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen. And, of course, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. That's all coming up. Now, here's the news. Did you know that we here at Bain love you all so much we're always giving away books? We are. Or, to put it more accurately, we're always in the midst of some contest or other. Because we love a good contest here at Bain. Each month over on Bain.com, we give away one signed copy of one of our new releases, and all you have to do to be entered to win is participate. This month, we're giving away one copy of Monster Hunter Memoirs, Sinners, signed by both Larry Correa and John Ringo. What's more, we're giving it away for a song. As the song says, for the holidays, you can't beat Home Sweet Home. But for a science fiction character, Home Sweet Home is more likely to be a far-flung planet than Pennsylvania and some homemade pumpkin pie. That's why we want you to help us update this holiday classic. Rewrite the lyrics to There's No Place Like Home for the Holidays and give them an updated science fictional twist. The author of the winning entry will receive a signed copy of Monster Hunter Memoirs Sinners, signed by both authors, John Ringo and Larry Correa. Send your entry to contest at bain.com no later than December 20th. Put December Contest in the subject field and please remember to include your name. One entry per person, please. Entries become property of Bain Books and may be published as part of the winning announcement. The winner will be selected at random from all qualifying entries. But wait! There's more! For the past few months, we've been doing giveaways through Goodreads.com. Those of you familiar with the platform will know that all you need to do is make an account on Goodreads and click to enter. This month, we're giving away five, count them, five copies of the same book, Monster Hunter Memoirs Sinners. Sorry, folks, these five aren't signed. That contest's going to be open until January 2nd, so there's plenty of time to enter. At this time, the Goodreads contest is limited strictly to readers in the United States. Our sincerest apologies to our international friends. You can find that listing either on Goodreads itself or by checking out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash banebooks, along with all sorts of news ranging from author appearances to eARC releases and back again. I'd like to welcome Lois McMaster Bujold to the podcast. She's a three-time Nebula Award-winning novelist and a five-time Hugo Award winner, four of those for Best Novel, matching Robert A. Heinlein's record. She's the author of more than 25 novels, including the Sharing Knife series, the Chalian series, and, of course, the Vorkosigan saga. For those of you listening, Miles Vorkosigan, his mother Cordelia, and the planet and empire of Barriar need little introduction. The series hit the ground running in 1986 with the publication of Shards of Honor, The Warrior's Apprentice, and Ethan of Athos, and, well, the rest is history. Last month, Bain re-released her 1991 Hugo Award-winning novel The Vor Game, along with the trade paperback debut of the latest in the series, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen. With two books out last month from such a venerated series, and with Borders of Infinity around the bend in January, now seemed like a great time to look back on the series at the end of its 30th year. Thank you so much for joining us, Miss Bujol. Thank you, Christopher, for inviting me. Oh, no, our pleasure. Uh, let's uh, jump right in then, shall we? Uh, the War Game was published back in 1990, but before that, a part of it appeared in Analog that same year as The Weatherman. Uh, was the finished War Game already taking shape in your mind, or did it come up in a second wave after the publication of the novella? Aha, uh-huh. that's an that's a 
interesting question because people usually get it backwards. Uh, the war game was actually an outtake from the first draft, the finished first draft of the novel. When I was looking at it uh, and thinking, oh, I could do this you know, with this section, it would excerpt beautifully. Oh. And I figured it would be like an ad for the novel. And uh, I had had uh, prior experience with analog. Well, I had experience with analog going way back to my, you know, to my teens when I had a subscription when John W. Campbell was editing. But my first sale to analog was, analog was actually Falling Free the uh, prior year. And then I had uh, also sold them a couple of the novellas that went into the Borders of Infinity collection. So I was like attuned and, you know, aware of this, uh, this marketing possibility for that length. And it worked out really well. Yeah, I had, I had no idea it was the other way around. Uh, but speaking of the Weathermen part of the book, uh, I was talking to Tony, uh, Tony Weiskopf about the war game and the whole series a couple weeks back, and she was telling me that a uh, Lieutenant Ahn, who was the, the, the weather officer at the Kuril Island station for four miles, uh, that he was based uh, in small part on your father's. Is that true? I've heard a lot of talk that Leo in Falling Free was also inspired by your father, and uh, that Dr. Vorthes in Komar and Civil Campaign was too. He sounds like uh, quite the figure. Um, was he a meteorologist then? or Not exactly. He was a... Uh... His PhDs were in physics and electrical engineering uh, from Caltech back in the 40s, and, uh, but he'd had a meteorology course in grad school there as well. And in fact, uh, some of the research he got into in World War II was for things like lightning strikes on bomber planes. <laughs> that was some interesting research flights over California, I'm told. Oh, wow. But anyway, after, after uh, he graduated, he came to Columbus, Ohio to work at the Tell Memorial Institute, and then in the 50s, came over to the university and taught in engineering. Uh, but he'd had a moonlighting job in the 50s because he had, you know, three kids. <laughs> and professor's salaries were not then very large. No. And his moonlighting job was uh, television weatherman for WBNS-TV Channel 10 in Columbus, Ohio. So he was actually the second television weatherman in the country, so they were pretty much making it up uh, as they went along there. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so awesome. Much more primitive. Yeah, he would, he would write, you know, the tomorrow's predictions with a squeaky flow pen on, you know, little pieces of paper stuck up to a board. And, <laughs> but he had time, so he always uh, included a little, uh, because it was longer than would include a little lecture about, you know, whether he'd do a little educational bit in the middle of his weather reports uh, back in the early days uh, before things got much tighter. So anyway, that was, that, was his, uh, that was his weather thing. But the thing about his reports and uh, predictions on, on for his television show was that he was actually more accurate than the uh, weathermen who were doing the weather for the SAC bomber pilots who were flying out of Lockbourne Air Force, Air Force Base. <laughs> And they get to, like, calling him up to get weather from him instead of from their own guys, <laughs> which <laughs> be, uh, a problem because it was yeah, actually a, uh, a violation of protocol. <laughs> oh, yeah. Secret. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. So, yeah, yeah, if they want to know what was really going on in Thule, they would ask him. Sounds get a more like, reliable word. <laughs> sounds like quite the character. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so there was that going on. So that idea that, you know, that a person might know more than the, the machines, you know, just by experience and knowledge base, uh, that is the element that went into Lieutenant Anne from him. Nothing else about Anne is anything like my father. No, no, I, I now that I say that out loud, I guess <laughs> that, that was probably, yeah, with the, uh, the not wearing pants and... Leading question. <laughs> So yeah, so and then you know, then I took other elements from him uh, as I went along uh, because of what he did and and um, so on. I kind of got to know a lot of engineers. In fact, my brother went through his welding engineering course and graduated there for at Ohio State. Uh, older brother, so the engineer type was kind of kind of in my in my range of experience, and that kind of went into Leo Graf. And then the, the more professorial uh, sort of, uh, that aspect of my dad uh, went into uh, Dr. Vorteis in the later Miles books. Uh, there's a lot of elements of, of that. Uh, my pronunciations are all wrong. <laughs> yeah, so that personal that got more of his personality than any of the other characters that, that took bits from that part of my experience. Yeah, well, Dr. Vorteis is definitely a more flattering comparison. I need to walk back when I said that. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah, no, he was great, though. But well, that's, uh, that's a different book. Back to the war game, though. As Foundationer as Warrior's Apprentice is, is it fair to say that the war game is where Miles really comes into his own, in a sense? Uh, talk a bit about where his head's at right after the Kuril Island stuff as he's stepping out onto the galactic stage for the first time, like, officially 
uh, not just uh, not just on vacation that goes terribly wrong. <laughs> or right. Uh, the board game, I think, or uh, the Warrior's Apprentice, I think of his, as his apprenticeship stage. And the board game is the journeyman. You know, he's had some training. He's supposed to be able to do it right now. You know, so now he's he's really got to got to uh, not make it up all as he goes along. He has to work with other people. He's got fates riding on it considerably closer to home than than what he was doing uh, out in in the Warrior's Apprentice when he sort of stumbled into somebody else's war by accident. But yeah, immediately after the Carol Island sequence of the board game. Miles' head was in some disarray because uh, his, his grand plans for being a good officer and putting in his six months at this awful post and, and then getting promoted to space duty crashed and burned uh, with, the, uh, with the disaster that he ran into there. So he was kind of on house arrest for the first while immediately after <clears throat> and uh, not very happy about it. So he was delighted to get you know this uh, thing that got him out of assignment that got him out of Impsec's basement uh, and you know, out in the world once more where he could like, prove himself once again. He's always trying to prove himself. And he dug himself a pretty deep hole, so he was really scrambling to get out at that point. So his, his headspace is sort of constrained ambition at that point when, when the story starts off. You know, he has all these ideas about how he's, he's going to be the good soldier this time around. And, of course, that gets blown out of the water by events. But that was, that was where he was at starting out. And it was, it was a story that tested him not only as a young officer, but also as a boar, as someone with responsibility to his world above and beyond his military role. And that was something he always has trouble balancing. Right, the two lives he ends up having as the series go on. Mm-hmm. That and there's a, there's a more subtle thing going on in that he has military duties as an officer, but he has political duties as a as a boar, and they aren't always compatible. So right. it's like trying to serve two masters, and uh, some of the plot of the boar game kind of hit him out at that point. You know, okay, here, here are these two choices. One is right for this role, and one is right for that role. Which one are you going to choose? And so uh, so that was fun. Right. The, the answer seems to be to become two people. <laughs> mm, yeah, I kind of like he really was trying to do everything. Yeah, it, it, it nearly works. Yeah. <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, and then it then it stops dramatically. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another book. We'll get to that on the next reprint. We'll get that, yeah. Some reprint down the line, yeah. Oh man, Mirror Dance, what a what a ride. For all the work that Shards of Honor and the Warrior's Apprentice do to ground the world building, it seems like the Vor game goes a long way towards synthesizing a lot of the different things we see in the earlier books uh, prior to this one's publication. Things like the Jacksonians and the Cetagandans, they all seem to come together in this in this one book. Was that a very intentional thing, or is that just a consequence of telling a larger story? Yeah, I kind of, um, I do not and have never had a grand overarching plan for the series. You know, I know as much about Miles' next year as he does, yeah as a general rule. And I do much of my world building um, on the fly. Somebody called it just-in-time world building. You know, I, will, uh, I will have a story I want to tell, and I will make up you know, the world to be the backdrop or setting for it. Uh, this is the opposite of the way some writers work. Some writers do an elaborate amount of world building and then set their characters loose as sort of tour guides. You know, I've made up this wonderful world. Let me show it to you uh, through these characters. And I'm the other way around. I take characters, and you know they have... They have action, they have impulse, they have things I want to say about them, and the world comes up around them as needed. So as long as all the pieces are in place, you know, it doesn't really matter what order they, you devise them in. Uh, nobody can tell the difference at the end. So uh, I had made up Jackson's Hole for the novella Labyrinth, uh, which I had written prior to the board game. Actually, the, uh, and the, uh, the story also in Borders of Infinity, uh, uh, The Borders of Infinity, mm-hmm. the novella, uh, I had written, actually in the middle of writing Falling Free, I had been uh, working on that, and then I broke off and did the novella and then returned to Falling Free. So that was the very first novella I, I actually wrote for that, and it went off uh, to a uh, anthology Bain, or, yeah, anthology Bain was doing called Freelancers. Uh, it was a requested, you know, requested submission. That right. was my first experience with that as well. So I had made up, you know, I'd made up pieces of the universe uh, for these various stories by the time I arrived at the war game. I'd done first Miles book. I did, could, I did Shards of Honor. I did Warrior's Apprentice. And I did Ethan of Athos and Falling Free. And then Brothers in Arms was the next one uh, where I jumped forward to Miles with his, you know, with his functioning mercenary fleet. Uh, right sort of further along in his career. And uh, Jim Bain, of course, wanted more military science fiction. 
<laughs> in fact, tried to prime the pump by sending me a copy of uh, B.H. Little Hearts, uh, L-Y-D-D-I-L-H-A-R-T, uh, British general and military historian, called On Strategy, or, or Strategy, I don't remember now, huh? title. But he was a very interesting uh, character. He had also been an acquaintance of T.E. Lawrence, who's uh, another character I'd read a lot about uh, in my youth. Very oh, yeah, likewise. Early character. <laughs> character is the word. So, yeah, so anyway, so I had, had strategy in hand, and I had this, you know, I wanted to please my publisher and, and write them some military science fiction. Brothers in Arms had sort of drifted off into spy thriller territory. So I, I will do one straight-up military science fiction story, and I ended up on Carroll Island, which is about as military as you get, but not really what you think of as space opera. And by the way, Carroll Island had some roots in uh, to E. Lawrence. He had written a book called The Mint, which is a memoir of his weird period after World War One, when he tried to rejoin the RAF as an enlisted man under an, uh, a pseudonym, which didn't work out for him. But he had this, this Horrible basic training experience. Nervy, intelligent guy plunged out into this situation. Very interesting book, but uh, a little of Carroll Island was based on that, actually. I'd have to look at that. Yeah, also, on stories told me by a, a engineer friend of my mother's who had worked on building Thule Air Base back in the day. So I was, I was getting sources you know, from all over. So I, so I sort of set miles off to Carroll Island, and for a little while there, it almost looked like it was going to turn into a military murder mystery, but. But I had started out with the idea of how does he get back to the then dairy, and I had to work my plot around to you know make that happen because he had left them at the end of Warrior's Apprentice, you know, apparently right. never going to see them again. And it was clear in Brothers in Arms that things were up and running, so uh, there had to be a transition, and so the story was devised to to bridge that gap. You know, what what had happened to get from there to here? Yeah. So that's that's kind of how it came into into existence. That actually uh, that leads pretty neatly into my next question because, like you were saying, that uh, this book came out after Borders Infinity and Brothers in Arms. Um, mm -hmm. what, what sort of things do you have to take into account when you're trying to fill in this middle puzzle piece? Or is it just all plotting? Or Yeah, it was, it was a, all of this was a learning experience. My entire career has been on-the-job training. So this is <laughs> kind of the first time I was trying to do that. Um, and uh, as I went further and further along in the series, I did fewer and fewer of these <laughs> interstitial things because they're hard. Uh, the one thing about writing a, a book in between is that the ending is constrained. Uh, you can't have any character development or any events that would change the outcome to the point where what you have already written wouldn't fit anymore. So it's, uh, that's a challenge, I guess. <laughs> problem it's a solvable problem but uh, but it's not the same as writing a book where anything can happen and you're work, sort of on the working face of uh, of your timeline's progression uh, and the uh, the psychological aspect of that you know the character development has to be stay within the lines i guess yeah. uh, and, and or the other thing is that it can be parts of it can be taking place sort of out of sight you know here's this thing that happened but it doesn't affect what happened later you know or very much not at that time. So it's it's a very tricky thing to do. It's not by any means impossible. Well, no. But <laughs> yeah, but it's a different, here we are. A little different process. I guess you kind of have answered this a little bit, but do you keep a lot of notes, a lot of records about things and where they are in space and time so that you can fit these things in, or am, am I overthinking it? I, I know you said you tend to be sort of an on-the-fly world builder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, my my take on it now is, you know, I've got I've got the novel. If it's in the novel that I've written, I can look it up, and if it's not, I can change it. You know, so I don't actually need a ton of world building. Um, some writers do this for fun. You know, that's the part they enjoy. Uh, right. Making up worlds. Now, for each story that I write, I sit down and do a lot of detailed world building. You know, for that setting, for that sequence, you know, for the immediate situation of that story. Do research reading. I will make copious notes. But that's not the same as having a pre-existing world you know, into which I'm trying to fit a story. Although, as the series grew organically, you know, it sort of acquired its own world-building weight uh, that I had to work with, you know, things, things that I could not contradict, things that I had stuck myself with. Uh, so there's always that uh, to, to keep balanced. Yeah, I guess it's that old engineering adage about how any idiot can build a bridge, but the trick is to build one that just barely stands. That. <laughs> <laughs> stands up. Yes. <laughs> it's really reassuring to hear. I, uh, I, I I write too. I just sold my first book, and I I tend to just throw things together 
too. So I'm glad it's uh, it's not just me, and I'm not doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, there is no wrong. There is no wrong method. Now you can end up with wrong results from any method, but that's you know that's between you and your page and your editor. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but yeah, it's uh, there. There's no wrong way to do it as long as it all fits and stands up in the end. Oh, it's uh, it's a relief to hear. I have a bad habit of second guessing myself, as Tony Daniel tells me uh, frequently. I, I was sitting in when you did your Gentleman Joel interview back in February, and if I remember correctly, you said something about uh, not wanting to write villains anymore or being tired of writing villains. But the board game has one of the best, in my opinion, in Cavillo, a, uh, a beautiful and utterly ruthless mercenary captain. She's not what one would expect from the leader of a band of mercenary pirates, uh, not that science fiction doesn't have a long history of those, but where did she come from? Well, her most immediate source was probably Blake Seven. There was a character named Servalan who was a powerful female, you know, very slinky, villainous character, who was, uh, was interesting. Looking back on that series and thinking about it now, she was a character made up and written by men, but she had two episodes that were written by, as I recall correctly, Tanith Lee, in which her character became more complex all of a sudden, you know, just for those two episodes. And so it's yeah, there was something in there about the way men write women and the way women write women. But mostly, I wanted to, I wanted to have a powerful character, sort of equal opportunity villainy. So that was that was kind of fun to do with her. <laughs> yeah, I've never worked out the totality of her backstory, but she's got to have one. You know, how she arrived at, at where she was, and so angry and so uh, so ruthless. Right. Yeah, she just hits in every possible direction. <laughs> just so much backstabbing. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's what you want from a villain. You know? Oh yeah, but it's not a really good, good, good quality if you're if you're trying to make things work for yourself. <laughs> no, <laughs> people remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Blake Seven, though, I guess I can see that. I'd forgotten about but there's, it. There's a bit of that, and then she came from other things as well. Nothing in my writing, at least, has a single source. It's always some blending or alloy of sources that go into it and come up with something, you know. No, of course. Any of the sources, you know, bronze is different from copper and tin. One of my favorite things about the Vore game was that it's the book where we probably see the most of one of my favorite side characters, uh, Emperor Gregor. Were there any particular challenges from a writerly perspective to bringing the Emperor of Beriar along on an adventure that readers wouldn't really think about? Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's that that job title Emperor that throws people off. To me, he's Gregor. Yeah, he's, he's like a character I know pretty much inside and out. I saw him when he was five. Yeah, it's sort of like having changed his diapers. Um, <laughs> So he has he has no uh, uh, he doesn't intimidate me in the least no. <laughs> as a character that I am writing. And uh, yeah, he does. He learns to be intimidating, but he has to learn it as a as a performance almost uh, as he goes along in his career. So uh, so that was yeah wasn't really that you know there was a lot of fun playing with people's expectations of what an emperor should be as a sort of stereotype. And then Gregor, who is this sort of live human being, walks in and doesn't fit the stereotype, and uh, that's always that's always worthwhile. So no, I didn't find him uh, didn't find him especially difficult to write. It was fun to explore him, to give him some stage time, and and see what these you know these possibilities that he had uh, would turn into uh, in the challenge of you know, actual events, and actually getting him to giving him some dialogue. <laughs> uh, dialogue is great. Dialogue is oh, it's the best. It's my favorite part, too. Yeah, it allows characters to display themselves very directly, uh, <clears throat> not necessarily truthfully, but uh, but always authentically. Uh, so when you think about it, stage plays are entirely dialogue, uh, and, and yet they manage to convey so much. Yeah, and that way you don't get stuck in the uh, the show-don't-tell problem, and mm -hmm. dialogue can't really lie. One of, those, one of those things that is, like, been so misinterpreted, yeah, it, it has some validity underneath, yeah. But what it is is looking at the difference. Uh, my friend Pat Reedy does a lot of writing teacher, and she prefers to say it, dramatize or narratize is how she puts it. There are parts of the story you want to dramatize. You want to get up in close and show all the details. There's some that you want to be narratives. You want them to sort of pick up their skirts and go you know, quickly over to the next you know, important section. There's things you need to know, but it doesn't need a scene. And I think newbie writers are sometimes misled by this and you know, put in a lot of things that really don't deserve to be scenes because they're trying to show instead of tell. Telling has its place. <clears throat> it's also, there's a, um, there's a transition between earlier forms of writing, 19th century, basically prior to 
visual media, you know, before film um, and television. The stories were told. You expected it to be a narrative. You had frequently a, an omniscient narrator, you know, telling you this tale and dipping in and out of people's heads and, you know, spreading it all before you as if he were a storyteller or she were a storyteller, if it's Jane Austen. And, and this is the omniscient viewpoint um, with the omniscient narrator. And that's kind of gone out of style and been replaced by this third-person personal and jump cuts and a whole lot of techniques, literary techniques, that are actually taken from film and television. I was Viewing audiences got, have gotten more and more sophisticated uh, to uh, to follow these kinds of transitions and structures. Uh, so and that has bled back into into writing uh, and changed the way we write. Uh, so it's like, all of them are good. It's just depending on whether it fits the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, I'd never considered that film was really the watershed for that, but that's definitely the difference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we've gotten under writing, but <laughs> go ahead. We're back to back to the Borkosovers. <laughs> Back to Gregor for a minute. One of the things I really like about him as a character is that he's a he's a man living in perpetual fear of himself to a certain extent. Like a like a lot of historical royal families, his family is a history of mental illness, and a part of this book is his coming to terms with that and with who his father really was. Do you think this deep fear of himself is part of what makes him into a good man and a great emperor, or or is it Cordelia being a good influence? It makes him into himself. Um, it's yeah, it's one of his salient psychological characteristics, uh, it could have gone a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, it almost made him weak. I mean, he ran away. He was so scared of it. So, uh, you know, so it all depends on how he handles it. Now, presumably, after the board game, he and Cordelia sit down and had a long talk and you know, <laughs> dealt with some of these issues uh, because he does get better afterwards. But, uh, but certainly it threw him for a loop. Um, you know, finding this out about his family and, you know, is, this is my family, is it me? Because yeah, Vora and many other people are persuaded to identify with their families as an important source of identity. Uh, and you have to, like, sometimes find a boundary there. You know, actually, they are not me and I am not them. Uh, we, are, we are something different. This is a new generation. We can make other choices. So that's, that's kind of a, uh, a, a universal psychological problem that he taps into there, which is part of what makes him interesting to many readers. So yeah, he he does okay, um, but uh, but I don't think it's a source of strength for him. It's a challenge he has to overcome, and that is where the strength comes in. Well, I suppose it is a, a bit flippant of me to make a joke about Cordelia just being a good influence, but Gregor and Miles were both raised by her and Lord Errol, and in a way their ideology and their worldview, uh, the, the parents' ideology and worldview, is what drives both Miles and Gregor. Do you think it's fair to say that even though this is Miles' story, the, or the whole series is Miles' story to a certain extent, but that it's really his parents' worldview that defines the series as a whole? Uh, yes and no. That's what I say. It drives Miles up the wall. <laughs> his mother's and his father's worldviews are different from each other. They're not the same. You know? no. He has to like, try to blend them within himself and balance them. His mother coming from Beta Colony with her, you know, her assumptions and beliefs about the world, and his father coming uh, from, basically got, he's, he's a, like his father Piotr, he's a very transitional character. You know, he starts in this older world and makes a transition to the modern one, and hauls Barrier along with him to a great extent. So he's got, you know, he's got a tremendous amount of things, Errol's got a tremendous amount of things going on in that, and Miles, too, you know, as, as I look back on him, the most recent book, he was 43, you know, looking back on his whole lifetime, he, too, is discovering that he's a transitional character, uh, which is what makes Barrier, you know, the, the cycle as a whole, a sort of metaphor for the 20th century, you know, this is, this is the world we all live in, where things are changing, you know, faster than we can really assimilate them, and and we didn't all make it up ourselves. Some of it comes from the outside. So very <clears throat> interesting in my international travels, getting a sense of some places where you know, they're living. They're living in the now, but they didn't make it. You know, the future was imported from outside and imposed upon them. And I think that's different from the American view, where we kind of we kind of made it up and it belongs to us. You know, the future is ours because we invented it here. I think that's psychologically different, and uh, Barrier is, is like one of these places where the future was not invented here, it was dropped on them, and then they had to, like, respond to it. By contrast, America has very little pasts. I, I've only been to Europe the once, and I was struck where everywhere I looked, these buildings were hundreds, maybe in some cases over a thousand years old, 
and we don't have mm -hmm. that either, so it's sort of a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Although I guess Barriar gets to have it all kinds of ways now. Um, air cars and castles and... <laughs> <laughs> Lords and swords and, and spaceships, yep. We got it all. But we, in a way that makes sense, both historically and psychologically, there's a lot of world-building that, you know, that wants that effect without making the cause make any sense, and that tends not to work, but, but that's all right. Those are different stories in there in pursuit of different objectives. So yeah, so barrier is, is very much a metaphor uh, for for our world. And all the changes it went through. Uh, and speaking of changes, uh, the Vor game wasn't the only Vorkoskin book we've released in the past month or so. The latest volume, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen, which sees Miles' mother Cordelia return to the main character spot for the first time since Barry R in 1994, is new in trade paperback. Now this is a very different kind of Vorkoskin book from the Vor game. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, first of all, Cordelia is a very different character than Miles, and I was like, 38 when I wrote the board game and 65 when I wrote Gentleman Joel. So you've got you know, another another generation of experience under the writer's belt at that point. Um, but yeah, the uh, I had finished Cryoburn, and at that point I felt like the series had come its full cycle. You know, from page three of Shards of Honor, where we first met Errol, to the epilogue of Cryoburn, where we see the last of them, and that's a sort of one complete generation of of change and, and things to observe. Um, and then, of course, the fans were having none of this. They wanted more, more, more. Then I, I sort of revisited Ivan as, as dessert. Uh, so that was um, uh, what became Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. That was a prequel. That's another prequel, actually, that went back. Uh, it was set four years prior to Cryoburn, uh, and a lot of things, you know, had, had not impinged. But Ivan lives in his own bubble. He doesn't intersect <laughs> miles. As <much laughs> That's very true. Uh, so that wasn't too hard to do. Um, and it was fun to do uh, Ivan's viewpoint at greater length. And that was, yeah, okay, that was fine, that was dessert. And, of course, everybody kept asking about what happens to Miles after Errol's death. And I thought that was not the most interesting question. Uh, it occurred to me after a while that the most interesting question was what happens to Cordelia. Because Miles' life actually grows more constrained upon his father's death. He steps into those very large shoes and yeah. tries to walk the walk. He has, you know, he has many commitments that he's made that he now must serve. You know, he's committed to a wife, he's committed to a family, he's committed to you know, his government service, um, you know, much, of, you know, much of which is sort of came down to him. It wasn't necessarily chosen. But he's, you know, he's doing a good job, but it's not story material. But, uh, Cordelia's life curiously opened up you know, after the first numbness wore off. Uh, you know, suddenly she had more choices she could make. She had uh, she had a wider world rather than a more restricted one, and that that began to niggle at my mind. And I sort of decided I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore grief and recovery, which is something I know a little about from real life. I wanted to explore uh, what a woman is like who is you know not putting up with crap anymore. <laughs> that was fun. So. So there were a lot of things that went under that, but it wasn't a wasn't going to be an action adventure story. It was pretty clear from the beginning. Uh, I tried, heaven knows, I tried to shove some kind of you know action adventure intrigue something plot into it. It wasn't having any because that's not what that book was about. It was about these other things, and the action plot would have been an interruption uh, to the main thrust of the narrative. And so I eventually, I eventually reconciled myself to that. And, okay, this is. It's got to be written the way it needs to be written, and then it unlocked. It actually <clears throat> took a long time to write. I had started niggling with the ideas back when I was stuck in the middle of Ivan's book for a while and had made some notes and put them away, or speaking of notes again, <laughs> and then returned to it a year later when Ivan's book was all put to bed, and, and that's, that's when I really came to grips and started thinking about, you know, I can make, I can make something out of this, but it won't be <laughs> what people expect, which is fine. Everybody says they weren't surprised. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so that was, that was a thing, and then I wrote, wrote the beginning, and then I got jammed up for a long time. I had a lot of things going on in my life at the time, including major surgery and a house move. And it was like a couple of years in the middle of the thing uh, before I finally came back uh, at the end of 2014, I guess it was, and finally saw my through line and where it could go, how it could go as a story. And then it finished up in a fairly short amount of time. So that's that's kind of the saga of how that book got written. It took me four years. I was going to say, it has to be four or five years. Much longer than usual, you know. 
but it was a book that didn't have easy models. You know, I couldn't just copy the genre conventions because I wasn't working inside them for this book. I had to find my own to find my own route. And that was that was interesting. Right, and the social comedy is sort of a, a lost art uh, to a certain extent. I think not totally. In, in genre, at the very least. No. Yeah. So uh, everybody's chasing vampires or whatever this week's thing is. I hope zombies are done. I, I do, too. I think it is still zombies because that TV show won't die. Mm, okay. That's what I get for not watching television. Yeah. I'm spared. <laughs> um, I'd be okay if vampires came back and they did it right, but... Uh... That'll, that'll never happen. Um, but speaking of surprises, we talked about uh, this book, Surprising. Um, back in February when we did the original Gentleman Joel podcast, I was sitting quietly in the corner observing. Tony said we'd talk about spoilers because um, we couldn't really talk about the plot of the book without spoiling any of it, and it had just come out. Yeah. Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen hinges on some revelations about Cordelia and uh, Errol Vorkoskin's private lives. Mm-hmm. Can you uh, talk a bit about why you chose to go in this particular direction and how it came to be? Or was it something you don't that you had always planned? I know you said you don't usually, but this seemed like a fairly big thing. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a interesting problem of viewpoint. Back in 1989, when I was writing the War Game, uh, which is the first book in which uh, Oliver Joel turns up, he didn't have a first name yet. I looked at the scene where he walks on stage with Errol just very briefly at the end of the Carol Island sequence and thought, "Oh my God, Miles, what you're not seeing." <laughs> um, because I know more about Errol than, than Miles does, but uh, but that was left as a as a plot possibility that you know that there could be a romantic attachment between those two characters, Errol and Joel, and uh, it went along for years. I have a I have a me- another metaphor for it. I call it Schrodinger's cat carrier. It's like there's story ideas that could be alive or could be dead, and I won't know until I open the box. And so that's where that, that idea uh, for that relationship sat for, for years and years. And then I went through the other books, you know, Meridance and Memory, and then sent Cordelia and, and Errol off to Surgar, which is something I had not envisioned uh, when Joel first came on stage. And then, you know, the, the sort of act two of the relationship developed out of that setting possibility. Uh, once again, you know, it wasn't part of Miles' life, and it was outside of his viewpoint. Now, this also comes from a lot of, you know, family experiences of myself and other people telling me about theirs, you know, about, you know, things they didn't know about their family because nobody mentioned it to them. Turns out to be pretty common experience. Uh, one of my friend's cousins, for example, had an illegitimate child at a time when she was away at college, and when she got back, the family kerfuffle was all over. And nobody mentioned it to her. She didn't find out for like years later. Uh, so that's, that's pretty typical. One of my aunts had a previous marriage and a kid that, you know, a cousin that I'd never heard about until I was like in my 30s, you know, because nobody mentioned it to me. They all knew. But, you know, I was, I was the youngest kid and all those conversations had taken place before I came along. Uh, nobody was talking about it anymore. So that kind of family secret is, is like a normal human thing. Uh, except being the Varkosigans, it's kind of writ large. But then we come into the science fiction aspects of it, where we have the uterine replicator, uh, which I've already explored as a, uh, uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, Chris Miles himself came out of the uterine replicator, and in fact, so did his mother. And so it's like, what can I do? What more can I do with this technology than what I have shown on stage so far? We've had you know, the clones from the clone brain transplants. We've had uh, you know, the 17... 17- Children of the Rape Victims of Escobar way back when. So we've had all these things that I've done. Oh, and Athos, of course. You said of Athos. So we've had single gender parenting uh, with, uh, with uterine replicators. So I was interested in generational changes that could take place in fundamental family structures with this new technology. Because all of a sudden, you're not tied to the biological clock anymore. Uh, this is something I think women are more conscious of than men. But men, too, you know, they get to a point where it's like, no, I, mean, I don't want to have kids now. I'm too old to deal with it. So it's, it's not just a, just a thing for women. But, uh, but with this technology, it sort of throws gender and even being alive out the window as a, as a necessary prerequisite for having children. Uh, and I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to explore that technology and its impact on people's lives. You know, how, how would this work? So Cordelia and Joel and, and Errol became uh, test guinea pigs for, for this uh, social experiment, uh, thought experiment. So that was fun. That was the science fiction part of it. The title, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen, uh, doesn't just refer, the Red Queen does not just refer to Cordelia. It also refers to the, uh, the theory in biology that uh, sex is successful as a biological evolutionary development because it helps, uh, helps us compete faster with 
parasites and uh, diseases. Uh, mixing up the genes more every generation keeps us ahead of this this ongoing uh, pressure of uh, evolutionary pressure uh, from from the microscopic uh, side of dangers, uh, which is not something you could you know hit with a sword or blast <laughs> blast with a laser particularly well. No. Uh, so that was that was sort of the biology part of that. I thought all science fiction readers would get that reference, but amazingly, very few have. So. There we go. The Red Queen theory. The Red Queen's race is the name of the theory. Like in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's where uh, that's where... where the biologists took it from. You know, so it went to one, two, skip, and then into into common coin, or not very common coin, but there it is. No, I didn't know the uh, there was a biological term for Possible. it. Possible. It's a biological theory. Go ahead. I didn't know it had crossed into biology uh, as a metaphor. Ah, uh-huh, yeah, no, it very much has. Yep. But this touches on something that I had noticed as I, I, I did read through the whole series this year for the first time. The uh, the genre of the Vorkoskin books change pretty radically as you progress through them. I mean, it changes one-to-one, but the general tone has shifted away from military science fiction towards, I guess we could call it social comedy, but it's it's not exclusively that. A- as you move forward through time, and as a consequence, Vorgame and Gentleman Joel are perhaps about as different as two books in this series can be. Is there an underlying reason for that, or is it just the sort of stories you were interested in telling? I get bored easily. I like different things. <laughs> After a while, it became a kind of a challenge. How many genres can I fit into one series? <laughs> They, books don't all have to be the same. No. The thing, one of the discoveries I made fairly early in my writing career is that there are no genre police. You know, nobody is going to come knock on your door at midnight because you colored outside the lines. So, so you know, it's, it's wherever the story goes. And uh, so it's, it's, you know, I write what I like. I write what I'm interested in. You know, I'm interested or was interested in military science fiction, so I wrote that. You know, I've written uh, social comedy. I've, I've written uh, scientific extrapolation, mainly in biology. I've written uh, thrillers and mysteries and uh, out-and-out comedies um, and uh, just all kinds of things. So it's, it's, it makes it not one of those cookie-cutter series where you have to have numbers to tell the books apart. Right. Punisher number 87 and all that, you know, <laughs> um, which has its place, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. I did not want to write the same book over and over. In fact, I seem to be incapable of writing the same book over and over. You know, once I've explored... A theme, that's all I have to say about that, and I need to find something else. Oh, makes sense to me. All right, and one more question, if you don't mind. I uh, I know you're semi-retired, but I wouldn't be being true to myself if I didn't ask the question nearest to my heart. Is there any chance we'll be seeing uh, Count Miles Vorkosigan again anytime soon? Are you working on something, maybe, or is it just too soon to say? It is too soon, you know, it's, it's kind of like I feel I have said all I have to say at this time, and I may acquire more things to say at a future date, you never know. Um, but yeah, there's nothing in the works on Miles at this point. Right now I'm pursuing an experiment in novella, uh, novella short writing and uh, e-publication with, uh, with a new character called Penric, not Penric and Desdemona actually, because he's kind of a double-headed dude. Um, over over on the fantasy side, uh, and uh, and that's been very interesting. I've got just published the e published the third novella in the series at this point, which is kind of developing into a series. These things happen when you're not looking. <laughs> it is a standalone. Um, so I'm going to be playing with that for a little bit more until I decide I want to do something else. That was the series you got the Hugo nomination for this last year, right? Uh yeah, I think it was uh, Pinnock. Uh, yeah, I've had a Hugo nomination. Yeah. Penrick and the Demon, the first, uh, uh, or Penrick's Demon, excuse me. That was the first novella. And it did indeed get a Hugo nomination, so that was cool. Yeah, no, congratulations on that. Well, I, I had to try. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> you and a lot of other people get in line. <laughs> oh, I will. I will. I have to see what comes. I can only write the stories that are in me. And I have to kind of dig them out. So. Oh, sure. I mean, if you're not okay. feeling it, it would be subpar, and then we would all cry. Yeah, well, or complain online. <laughs> a lot of that. But, uh, well, that's what the Internet's for, I've found. <laughs> yeah, I think writers get way more feedback these days than is good for them. You know, we didn't used to work in this goldfish tank, but uh, there you go. Yeah, trying to stay out of it as much as I can. Uh, well, um, thank you for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Good. Thank you for having me. All right, and once again, the books are The Vore Game and Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen, both available now in trade paperback from booksellers everywhere and in ebook form over at BaneEbooks.com.
Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy? The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 20 Brotherhood on Corsera Daniel sat with Adele on a loggia built onto the side of the spike. A curving staircase led down from the garden of one of the mansions facing the plaza. The rock was sheer enough at this point that the roof of the nearest house toward the harbor was still a dozen feet below the stone-railed alcove. It was a private spot, especially with Hogg and Tovera at the head of the stairs. I've been thinking about the next stage of the war, Daniel said. He glanced toward Adele, then looked away. He wondered whether he shouldn't have chosen a different place to talk with Adele. She didn't seem to be concerned that a carved lion crouched on the parapet looked over her shoulder, but the juxtaposition disturbed him. I didn't realize there was any difficulty, she said her eyes on the display of the data unit on her lap. I'm not a military professional, of course, but I understood you to say that you would leapfrog missile batteries until they're close enough to Hablinger to cover another assault. With the missiles in place, the Pantellerian squadron won't be able to respond as they did before. That's true, Daniel said, and it's about as straightforward as any military operation could be. All we, well... All the Independence Council has to do is wait a month until the deliveries from Karst start arriving. Maybe a little longer, knowing Karst, and then put out a general call to the miners. There won't be as many as there were for the first attack, but there'll be enough. He shrugged. When the Pantellerians realize the missiles are in place, they may simply abandon Haplinger if they can arrange safe passage. Daniel hadn't chosen this spot for the discussion out of concern for security aboard the Kaisha. Yes, of course he and Adele would have been overheard, but the only crew members who might have understood what they were talking about were the present or former commissioned officers. It was possible that a rigger might get drunk and blurt something in the wrong ear. It was no more likely that one of Daniel's officers would do so than that Daniel himself would. The problem was that he was working possibilities over by voicing them to Adele. With her as an audience, things that had seemed acceptable in his own mind might be reflected as embarrassing foolishness. She didn't have to say anything. Daniel would see it himself as soon as he articulated a bad plan. Adele was a cool, uninvolved wall from which Daniel bounced ideas. No one else whom Daniel knew could as ably fill that role for him. It's a month's delay, Adele said, or somewhat more unacceptable. The deal with Karst is unacceptable, Daniel said. If there's any other way of getting the same result. He was smiling down on the red, orange, tan roofs stretching down the slope to the harbor. From this angle, the houses were smothered in the foliage of the trees which grew in every garden and courtyard. Previous experience with mining worlds had led Daniel to expect raw earth and ugly piles of tailings. That was probably true upriver where the mines were actually located, but Brotherhood itself reminded him more of the Bantry estate than of an industrial wasteland. I had Cazalet and Corey look at the terms of the contract which the envoys agreed to, Adele said. She looked up from her display for the first time. They felt that while the Karst Junta couldn't be described as a charitable institution, the deal was fair and that they themselves would have agreed to it. Cazalet's family had owned a medium-sized shipping line before they were killed and their property expropriated by the Alliance bureaucracy. Corey's father was the largest paving contractor on Florentine, his homeworld. Daniel himself couldn't have chosen better business advisors than those two, save for his sister Deirdre. 
Oh, I don't question that it's a fair deal, Daniel said. I just don't like to see Karst getting the profit after the way they treated a Cinnabar envoy a few years ago. He let his smile spread as he looked down toward the harbor. Three freighters similar to the Kaiser were loading copper. One was anchored at a buoy in midwater. Her crew was bringing the ingots aboard from the barge moored alongside, a back-breaking job. I recall the incident, Adele said. Her voice was as cool and measured as if she hadn't herself been present on Karst when young headman Hieronymus insulted a Cinnabar senator and refused to renew Karst's long and friendly association with the Republic. That said, Hieronymus is dead. The reason the contract is in place is that you rescued the envoys so that the arrangements could be finalized. One step at a time, Adele, Daniel said. Now that we've reformed the Independence Council into a body which actually wants to win the war, we can refine the means by which we achieve that. Adele continued to look at him. There are those in Xenos, she said, who would be pleased to hear that the strongly pro cinnabar government of Pantelleria has recovered Corsera from the pro-Alliance exiles who had taken power there. Daniel laughed and met her eyes. Those are political considerations, he said, and I leave them for politicians. We're on Corsera to enable Rickard Cleveland to recover the treasure which he believes is buried here. I continue to think that a Corsiran victory is the best way to create conditions in which that will be possible. I would just like to achieve that. His smile remained broad, but he felt the muscles of his face tighten. Without bringing economic benefit to Karst. Adele watched him without replying. Something was going on behind her eyes, but it didn't leave readable signs on her face. I know that the Senate is willing to leave Karst be, Daniel said. Even Senator Forbes is. Senator Forbes may be willing to forgive the insult she received as envoy to Karst, said Adele, because that was the start of the sequence that led to her becoming defense minister, and led to the assassination of headman Hieronymus, of course. But I believe that the senator is too much of a politician to care about revenge for its own sake. The junta which killed Hieronymus and took power in Karst, said Daniel harshly, includes the advisors who convinced the boy to break with Cinnabar in the first place. The fact that they're fawning on the Republic now doesn't make me forget the way they insulted us in the past. You see, he grinned, restored to good humor by the thought. You see better than most, I suspect. You see that they not only insulted a Cinnabar envoy, they tried to humiliate O'Leary. The Senate does as it deems politic, but O'Leary takes care of his own honor. Understood, Adele said, with her usual lack of emotion. Daniel read amusement in her blankness, however. She pursed her lips and said, Daniel, while we were still on Cinnabar, I was given commissions— I won't say assignments, which go beyond our private agreement with the Sand family. Daniel shrugged. Of course Adele was involved in other matters. She was too valuable to the Republic not to be tasked with additional duties. Go on, he said aloud. It is possible, said Adele, that at some point our purposes will conflict. Daniel pressed his fingers against the stone bench. He didn't drum them, just let his conscious mind focus on the moss-cushioned roughness. If that should happen, he said carefully, turning to meet Adele's eyes again, you will inform me that there is a conflict. I will decide on a further course of action then. At this moment, I would expect to trust your judgment and honor, and therefore I would defer to you. She nodded crisply. And now, Daniel said, rising to his feet, I will meet with Colonel Bourbon in the manor. Would you care to come along? Lieutenant Corey says the Kaisha has received a message which he'd like to show to me, Adele said as she put away her data unit. I'm going back to the ship. I'll keep you informed as developments require. Which was something less than, I'll keep you informed of developments, Daniel realized as they started up the stairs. But there were many aspects of Adele's business on which he preferred to remain ignorant. Adele entered the Kaisha's bridge, expecting to find Corey, the duty officer, sitting at the command console, and no one else in the compartment unless a spacer was asleep in a bunk. The crew had performed without a real break since the ship lifted from Xenos, and Daniel believed in granting liberty to as great a degree as he could. 
Corey and Cazale stood beside the console facing the hatchway. When Adele stepped through, they braced to attention. Ma'am, said Corey, I asked Master Cazale for some help with this, but the responsibility is mine. Very well, Corey, Adele said. Please explain the situation. She sat at one of the jump seats and accessed the console through her personal data unit. She was certainly interested in what Corey had to say, but she had found that an individual's explanations were mainly valuable in illuminating the hard data which was an approximation of truth. The Kaisha received a message in an unfamiliar code, Corey said, still standing at attention. It was addressed to shipping representative Bantry Holdings. I asked Master Cazalet to take a look at it while I checked the source of the communication. Because I had been in the shipping business, Cazalet said. They were both very tense. I recognized it as a standard Pantelarian shipping code, key to the date of the first message in the series. Knowing that, and the fact it was Pantelarian, it was easy enough to run it back till the content stopped being garbage. Yes, said Adele. An astrogation computer could handle brute force computations like that in a heartbeat. Even without knowing that the key was in the Pantelarian calendar, the delay in reading would be insignificant. It was, after all, a shipping code meant to conceal arrival and pricing information from trade rivals for a few days. Did you read the communication? Adele asked, her eyes on the decoded message on her display. She spoke mildly. Ma'am, we didn't, Corey said. We just saw enough to know that it was none of our business. Um, said Adele. You couldn't be faulted if you had read it, it seems to me. But you're probably better off not having done so. We weren't sure whether it should go to Six or to you, Adele, Cazalet said. I said that since you had carried the Bantry Holdings authorization to the negotiations on Ischia, we'd start with you and you'd take it to Captain Leary if he was the correct recipient. Ma'am, Corey said. The origination of the message was Pantelarian HQ in Hablinger. The sender tried to disguise it, but he wasn't very good. I think one can take as a given, Adele said, feeling the humor of the situation that someone who uses a commercial code that's at least 20 standard years old, the inception date of the series, isn't an expert in cybersecurity. The code was probably the one that the Arno and Leary businesses had used to communicate from the beginning. When Pantelaria had joined, had been joined to the Alliance of Free Stars, the communication became treason on both sides, but the code hadn't been changed to something more secure. Arno. Because the message was from Commissioner Arnaud, had used it here because he assumed that a ship under Captain Leary brought an agent to discuss his demands for help from Cinnabar in reconquering Corsera. He was right in his assumption, though possibly not in the way he thought he was right. I'm the correct person to deal with this, Adele said. She looked up at the two officers, at her protégés, both of them. They deserved more than a brush-off. This is a matter that Captain Leary isn't aware of as yet, she said, though obviously it concerns him. You may reasonably think it your duty to take it to him directly. I will... That is, I won't blame you if you do. Corey looked at her incredulously. Ma'am, he said, we wouldn't do that. Lady Mundy, Cazalet said. He was standing more stiffly, if that was possible, than he had before. You've said that you're dealing with the matter, whatever it is. All that I, that either of us, need to know at this point is if there's any help we can give you. And you'll tell us in that case, I'm sure. Why are they loyal to me, Adele thought. They should be concerned that I'm plotting with the enemy and hiding information from Daniel, which is just what I'm doing. Corey and Cazale accepted that she wasn't Daniel's enemy, even when the data would support the conclusion that she was. Support did not mean compel, and they trusted her, as they had every reason to do. Very well, she said. I have nothing at present, but I will give you such tasks as circumstances require, as I have always done. We'll be in a hold, ma'am, Corey said. Just call if you need us. No, Adele said. Corey, you're on duty. Stay where you would ordinarily be, which I take to be the command console. Renee, I presume you're at liberty, so do as you please. Chatting with Corey appears much more reasonable than twiddling your thumbs alone in the hold, however. We won't disturb you, Cazalet said. No, said Adele, who lost herself so thoroughly in her focus that the world outside ceased to exist. 
I will continue to access the console from where I am now. She had to respond to Arno, but she couldn't say anything substantive until she had more information. She composed a neutral placeholder and sent it back along the convoluted track that would take it to Pantellarian headquarters. The original message demanded that, within three days, Daniel Leary make a public promise of Cinnabar support for the Pantellarian position, that is, for Commissioner Arnaud's invasion. Because of Daniel's public stature, the Independence Council would believe the promise and therefore be willing to compromise on terms that Arnaud would be able to claim was a victory for him. The alternative was that Arnaud would publish the whole course of his dealings with Bantry Holdings, claiming that he himself had been working against the Alliance oppressors. Speaker Leary would find it harder to justify the fact that he was building warships for the fleet. The information probably wouldn't do any good to the career of his estranged son either. Adele began working. She had sneered at Arnaud's skill at computer security, but try as she might, she couldn't find, let alone access, the computer on which he had composed his demand. It apparently wasn't hooked into the network in Hablinger, except during the moments that it was actually transferring data. Adele had to get into Arnaud's files so that she could modify them in the way she had planned. There was one obvious method, physical contact. That had its own set of problems, but she could consult experts. Daniel and Hogg were as skilled at physical intrusion as Adele was in her field. Chapter 20 Brotherhood on Coursera Daniel sat with Adele on a loggia built onto the side of the spike. A curving staircase led down from the garden of one of the mansions facing the plaza. The rock was sheer enough at this point that the roof of the nearest house toward the harbor was still a dozen feet below the stone-railed alcove. It was a private spot, especially with Hogg and Tovera at the head of the stairs. I've been thinking about the next stage of the war, Daniel said. He glanced toward Adele, then looked away. He wondered whether he shouldn't have chosen a different place to talk with Adele. She didn't seem to be concerned that a carved lion crouched on the parapet looked over her shoulder, but the juxtaposition disturbed him. I didn't realize there was any difficulty, she said, her eyes on the display of the data unit on her lap. I'm not a military professional, of course, but I understood you to say that you would leapfrog missile batteries until they're close enough to Hablinger to cover another assault. With the missiles in place, the Pantellarian squadron won't be able to respond as they did before. That's true, Daniel said, and it's about as straightforward as any military operation could be. All we, well, all the Independence Council has to do is wait a month until the deliveries from Karst start arriving. Maybe a little longer, knowing Karst, and then put out a general call to the miners. There won't be as many as there were for the first attack, but there'll be enough. He shrugged. When the Pantellarians realize the missiles are in place, they may simply abandon Haplinger if they can arrange safe passage. Daniel hadn't chosen this spot for the discussion out of concern for security aboard the Kaisha. Yes, of course he and Adele would have been overheard, but the only crew members who might have understood what they were talking about were the present or former commissioned officers. It was possible that a rigger might get drunk and blurt something in the wrong ear. It was no more likely that one of Daniel's officers would do so than that Daniel himself would. The problem was that he was working possibilities over by voicing them to Adele. With her as an audience, things that had seemed acceptable in his own mind might be reflected as embarrassing foolishness. She didn't have to say anything. Daniel would see it himself as soon as he articulated a bad plan. Adele was a cool, uninvolved wall from which Daniel bounced ideas. No one else whom Daniel knew could as ably fill that role for him. It's a month's delay, Adele said, or somewhat more unacceptable. The deal with Karst is unacceptable, Daniel said. If there's any other way of getting the same result. He was smiling down on the red, orange, tan roofs stretching down the slope to the harbor. From this angle, the houses were smothered in the foliage of the trees which grew in every garden and courtyard. Previous experience with mining worlds had led Daniel to expect raw earth and ugly piles of tailings. 
That was probably true upriver where the mines were actually located, but Brotherhood itself reminded him more of the Bantry estate than of an industrial wasteland. I had Cazalet and Corey look at the terms of the contract which the envoys agreed to, Adele said. She looked up from her display for the first time. They felt that while the Karst Junta couldn't be described as a charitable institution, the deal was fair and that they themselves would have agreed to it. Cazalet's family had owned a medium-sized shipping line before they were killed and their property expropriated by the Alliance bureaucracy. Corey's father was the largest paving contractor on Florentine, his homeworld. Daniel himself couldn't have chosen better business advisors than those two, save for his sister Deirdre. Oh, I don't question that it's a fair deal, Daniel said. I just don't like to see Karst getting the profit after the way they treated a Cinnabar envoy a few years ago. He let his smile spread as he looked down toward the harbor. Three freighters similar to the Kaiser were loading copper. One was anchored at a buoy in midwater. Her crew was bringing the ingots aboard from the barge moored alongside, a back-breaking job. I recall the incident, Adele said. Her voice was as cool and measured as if she hadn't herself been present on Karst when young headman Hieronymus insulted a Cinnabar senator and refused to renew Karst's long and friendly association with the Republic. That said, Hieronymus is dead. The reason the contract is in place is that you rescued the envoys so that the arrangements could be finalized. One step at a time, Adele, Daniel said. Now that we've reformed the Independence Council into a body which actually wants to win the war, we can refine the means by which we achieve that. Adele continued to look at him. There are those in Xenos, she said, who would be pleased to hear that the strongly pro cinnabar government of Pantelleria has recovered Corsera from the pro-Alliance exiles who had taken power there. Daniel laughed and met her eyes. Those are political considerations, he said, and I leave them for politicians. We're on Coursera to enable Rickard Cleveland to recover the treasure which he believes is buried here. I continue to think that a Corsairan victory is the best way to create conditions in which that will be possible. I would just like to achieve that. His smile remained broad, but he felt the muscles of his face tighten. Without bringing economic benefit to Karst. Adele watched him without replying. Something was going on behind her eyes, but it didn't leave readable signs on her face. I know that the Senate is willing to leave Karst B, Daniel said. Even Senator Forbes is. Senator Forbes may be willing to forgive the insult she received as envoy to Karst, said Adele, because that was the start of the sequence that led to her becoming defense minister, and led to the assassination of headman Hieronymus, of course but I believe that the senator is too much of a politician to care about revenge for its own sake. The junta which killed Hieronymus and took power in Karst, said Daniel harshly, includes the advisors who convinced the boy to break with Cinnabar in the first place. The fact that they're fawning on the Republic now doesn't make me forget the way they insulted us in the past. You see, he grinned, restored to good humor by the thought. You see better than most, I suspect. You see that they not only insulted a Cinnabar envoy, they tried to humiliate O'Leary. The Senate does as it deems politic, but O'Leary takes care of his own honor. Understood, Adele said, with her usual lack of emotion. Daniel read amusement in her blankness, however. She pursed her lips and said, Daniel, while we were still on Cinnabar, I was given commissions— I won't say assignments, which go beyond our private agreement with the Sand family. Daniel shrugged. Of course Adele was involved in other matters. She was too valuable to the Republic not to be tasked with additional duties. Go on, he said aloud. It is possible, said Adele, that at some point our purposes will conflict. Daniel pressed his fingers against the stone bench. He didn't drum them, just let his conscious mind focus on the moss-cushioned roughness. If that should happen, he said carefully, turning to meet Adele's eyes again, you will inform me that there is a conflict. I will decide on a further course of action then. At this moment, I would expect to trust your judgment and honor, and therefore I would defer to you. She nodded crisply. And now, Daniel said, rising to his feet, I will meet with Colonel Bourbon in the manor.
Would you care to come along? Lieutenant Corey says the Kaisha has received a message which he'd like to show to me, Adele said as she put away her data unit. I'm going back to the ship. I'll keep you informed as developments require. Which was something less than, I'll keep you informed of developments, Daniel realized as they started up the stairs. But there were many aspects of Adele's business on which he preferred to remain ignorant. Adele entered the Kaisha's bridge, expecting to find Corey, the duty officer, sitting at the command console, and no one else in the compartment unless a spacer was asleep in a bunk. The crew had performed without a real break since the ship lifted from Xenos, and Daniel believed in granting liberty to as great a degree as he could. Corey and Cazalet stood beside the console, facing the hatchway. When Adele stepped through, they braced to attention. Ma'am, said Corey. I asked Master Cazalet for some help with this, but the responsibility is mine. Very well, Corey, Adele said. Please explain the situation. She sat at one of the jump seats and accessed the console through her personal data unit. She was certainly interested in what Corey had to say, but she had found that an individual's explanations were mainly valuable in illuminating the hard data which was an approximation of truth. The Kaisha received a message in an unfamiliar code, Corey said, still standing at attention. It was addressed to shipping representative Bantry Holdings. I asked Master Cazalet to take a look at it while I checked the source of the communication. Because I had been in the shipping business, Cazalet said. They were both very tense. I recognized it as a standard Pantelarian shipping code, keyed to the date of the first message in the series. Knowing that, and the fact it was Pantelarian, it was easy enough to run it back till the contents stopped being garbage. Yes, said Adele. An astrogation computer could handle brute force computations like that in a heartbeat. Even without knowing that the key was in the Pantelarian calendar, the delay in reading would be insignificant. It was, after all, a shipping code meant to conceal arrival and pricing information from trade rivals for a few days. Did you read the communication? Adele asked, her eyes on the decoded message on her display. She spoke mildly. Ma'am, we didn't, Corey said. We just saw enough to know that it was none of our business. Um, said Adele. You couldn't be faulted if you had read it, it seems to me. But you're probably better off not having done so. We weren't sure whether it should go to Six or to you, Adele, Cazalet said. I said that since you had carried the Bantry Holdings authorization to the negotiations on Ischia, we'd start with you and you'd take it to Captain Leary if he was the correct recipient. Ma'am, Corey said. The origination of the message was Pantelarian HQ in Hablinger. The sender tried to disguise it, but he wasn't very good. I think one can take as a given, Adele said, feeling the humor of the situation that someone who uses a commercial code that's at least 20 standard years old, the inception date of the series, isn't an expert in cybersecurity. The code was probably the one that the Arno and Leary businesses had used to communicate from the beginning. When Pantelleria had joined, had been joined to the Alliance of Free Stars, the communication became treason on both sides, but the code hadn't been changed to something more secure. Arno. Because the message was from Commissioner Arnaud, had used it here because he assumed that a ship under Captain Leary brought an agent to discuss his demands for help from Cinnabar in reconquering Corsera. He was right in his assumption, though possibly not in the way he thought he was right. I'm the correct person to deal with this, Adele said. She looked up at the two officers, at her protégés, both of them. They deserved more than a brush-off. This is a matter that Captain Leary isn't aware of as yet, she said, though obviously it concerns him. You may reasonably think it your duty to take it to him directly. I will... That is, I won't blame you if you do. Corey looked at her incredulously. Ma'am, he said, we wouldn't do that. Lady Mundy, Cazalet said. He was standing more stiffly, if that was possible, than he had before. You've said that you're dealing with the matter, whatever it is. All that I, that either of us, need to know at this point is if there's any help we can give you. And you'll tell us in that case, I'm sure. Why are they loyal to me, Adele thought. They should be concerned that I'm plotting with the enemy and hiding information from Daniel, which is just what I'm doing. 
Corey and Casale accepted that she wasn't Daniel's enemy, even when the data would support the conclusion that she was. Support did not mean compel, and they trusted her, as they had every reason to do. Very well, she said. I have nothing at present, but I will give you such tasks as circumstances require, as I have always done. We'll be in a hold, ma'am, Corey said. Just call if you need us. No, Adele said. Corey, you're on duty. Stay where you would ordinarily be, which I take to be the command console. Renee, I presume you're at liberty, so do as you please. Chatting with Corey appears much more reasonable than twiddling your thumbs alone in the hold, however. We won't disturb you, Casalet said. No, said Adele, who lost herself so thoroughly in her focus that the world outside ceased to exist. I will continue to access the console from where I am now. She had to respond to Arnaud, but she couldn't say anything substantive until she had more information. She composed a neutral placeholder and sent it back along the convoluted track that would take it to Pantellerian headquarters. The original message demanded that, within three days, Daniel Leary make a public promise of Cinnabar support for the Pantellerian position, that is, for Commissioner Arnaud's invasion. Because of Daniel's public stature, the Independence Council would believe the promise and therefore be willing to compromise on terms that Arnaud would be able to claim was a victory for him. The alternative was that Arnaud would publish the whole course of his dealings with Bantry Holdings, claiming that he himself had been working against the Alliance oppressors. Speaker Leary would find it harder to justify the fact that he was building warships for the fleet. The information probably wouldn't do any good to the career of his estranged son either. Adele began working. She had sneered at Arnaud's skill at computer security, but try as she might, she couldn't find, let alone access, the computer on which he had composed his demand. It apparently wasn't hooked into the network in Hablinger, except during the moments that it was actually transferring data. Adele had to get into Arnaud's files so that she could modify them in the way she had planned. There was one obvious method, physical contact. That had its own set of problems, but she could consult experts. Daniel and Hogg were as skilled at physical intrusion as Adele was in her field. That was another part of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a nexus full of interlocking multiplanetary polities, shaking in fear of the threat of Cetaganded invasion, plus the joyous cries of a replicator-grown generation yet unborn, and the generations that created them, all united in celebration of Lois McMaster Bujold, the author of The War Game, and of Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen, on this, the 30th anniversary of her career. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.